Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Okay, I'm back now. Okay, sorry, and if you wanna share it, go ahead and share your screen and uh, you can share your camera too. And we'll go ahead and get started. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, and sorry, you're still muted. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I am a Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And we are very excited today to have Sari Kilvanen, uh, the CEO and founder of OceanEye, um, here with us. She's going to be speaking about OceanEye, new technology for marine ecosystem service payments. I just wanted to let everyone know um, how the webinar will work really quickly. Um, sorry, we'll be presenting uh, about OceanEye, and then we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. Um, so if you, but you're encouraged to send in questions throughout the webinar, um, and then we can, we'll hold most of them till the question and answer, but we'd love to get them whenever you think of them. Uh, the questions will be, you can send them in either through the question panel, um, where only Sari and I will be able to see them, or you can send them into the chat where you can make them visible to only Sari and I or the entire audience. Um, we, with the chat, you can make things visible to everyone and you can respond to other people's uh, chats. And uh, we encourage you to chat um, about the topic. And we just ask that since you can um, be sending messages to everyone that you just keep it professional and on the topic. Uh, but we do encourage you to um, add learning and your thoughts and experiences in the chat. That, that's very welcome. Um, sorry, thank you so much for being here today. I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Great, thank you, Sarah. And um, good morning to everyone and good evening. I'm calling in from Finland, so it's evening time here. Um, I hope you can hear me. And if I'm, if I'm talking too fast or anything, please feel free to stop me. Or if you have any questions or clarifications, uh, please also just feel free to stop me. So I'm really excited to um, present OSANI um, to the marine conservation community and also to have a good conversation and, and especially the learnings and ideas on how we can move forwards and how we can improve what we're trying to do. So what is OSANI? Um, we are a technology, technology solution to protect marine biodiversity by monetizing tourism ecosystem service payments. And obviously everybody's talking about ecosystem service payments, but there's not been very many ways of how to actually get money to move to date. And we are trying to address that problem. Um, just a little bit background on marine tourism. Obviously, we are now coming out of the pandemic and these figures are pre-pandemic, but uh, it was marine tourism was one of the fastest growing tourism sectors. About 39% growth was predicted over the next four years and that was in 2019. Um, and now that the pandemic's kind of winding down, uh, the nature-based tourism is kind of predicted to be one of the areas that will recover the fastest. Um, obviously, people are very motivated to get back into the nature. And 
Diving particularly, uh, we all know it's very popular, but it was growing 16% per year in 2019. And there's already over 6 million dive tourists in the world. So we're not, we're not talking about small segments or kind of small audience uh, when we're talking about using tourism-based ecosystem service payments. So here's a little infographic just to explain the concept a bit more. So OSANI in itself is um, a browser-based platform that people can use on their smartphones or tablets. So tourists would go out on their tours, uh, whale watching, diving, snorkeling, sailing, cruising, um, any marine activity where you view marine life. And it can be any marine life that the animals can be selected and tailored to their location. So you can select the most vulnerable, the most interesting species in your region that are in need of protection. And there's two ways of kind of uh, operating the app. So either the operator will be the, the, the tourism operator will be the one who runs it and you enter the group, you log in the sightings and then you kind of administrate um, the payments to people and they will make the transfers or you as a tourist can just log in, make your own account, um, put in your own locations and then collect your own data and, and make the payments at the end of it. And how it works is that through OSNI, those payments will be directly and transparently um, transferred to the local coastal communities. So obviously, together with the operators, um, we will do an uh, assessment uh, where the money needs to go and, and how it can act as the biggest incentive there is to um, protect marine biodiversity. And what the communities will see is kind of a daily log of where the tourists are going, what animals they're seeing, how much money they're earning. And also, interestingly, the communities have requested us to kind of rank the nationalities of who's paying the most. Because at the end, when it comes to the OSINI algorithm kind of gives you a fee for the animals. So obviously, if people are seeing a lot of certain animal, then the, the fee will be smaller. And if it's a very rare animal, then the payment will be more. So it can be anything from like five cents to whatever the willingness to pay of the people are for animals like blue whales or dugongs, it can be quite high. But then at the end, when it comes to paying the bill, um, you can kind of give more or you can give less. So if you happen to see a um, thousand hammerhead sharks, um, your holiday isn't ruined because of the, the payment. But the communities um, requested to see the nationalities and, and how the payments go. So that's the, that's the basic operational architecture. Um, so as I said, uh, so they are small payments. So um, we've done kind of willingness to pay testing and others, and even through a one week of diving in very biodiverse areas, the payments probably won't end up being more than seven, ten dollars or something per person. So we're not talking about uh, huge donations, but it's the numbers that will kind of generate the, the revenues for the communities. And the idea really is that now the tourist dollar will be able to target it, will be able to target it to the communities that normally will not be able to participate in tourism activities and benefit from it. So we're talking about coastal communities, the fishing communities, especially in developing countries. Um, they don't have the know-how and the skills to be participants in the tourism industry. The money normally kind of goes to other players. So we're really looking at kind of how we can transfer the tourism benefits to the people who depend on the marine life and would otherwise, as we know, continue to fish and hunt, um, even in the presence of MPAs or other such things, if they don't have alternative livelihoods or alternative ways of uh, supporting themselves. And yeah, I mean, this is um, a well-known fact, but obviously a stakeholder buying in a lot of the marine management measures, such as MPAs, is a key success factor. And, and this is the pain point that we, we're trying to address is how to ensure that stakeholders buy in into marine conservation and also benefit from it. And in terms of the different stakeholders, we obviously have plenty. So the tourism sector, they are the ones who have to promote and, and enforce um, the use of Ocean Eye or promote it in their area. But obviously they have a lot of uh, skin in the game. They've invested in their the tourism businesses. And if they don't have their assets, the wildlife, um, they also don't have business. And quite often um, tourism operators feel quite powerless um, in areas, especially where there's a lack of authorities or lack of uh, enforcement um, and they can't get any help into these kind of poaching and 
the problems that they see in the area. So OSNI kind of seeks to provide a tool that the tourism sector can now play an active role in marine conservation. Um, in terms of the marine tourists themselves who will be making the payments, um, I mean, obviously the idea is that people who already go out of their way to beautiful places to see marine animals um, will feel empowered to know that they're contributing to conservation and they can continue to see more of these animals, hopefully in the future. And for the coastal communities, there is a direct uh, financial incentive that is easy to calculate and we're very easily able to show how much more um, you'll be able to earn over a lifetime of a shark over killing it once. Um, yeah, it won't take very many months of operations to, to reach those kind of amounts. So it's a very clear alternative for the coastal communities. And also what I'm really excited about is that we'll be able to um, kind of provide uh, citizen science in quite large volumes, hopefully and therefore also help save monitoring costs, uh, collaborate with authorities and, and help um, improve the overall management of these areas based on the data that we collect. And um, I guess the biggest difference between Ocean Eye and kind of other fees that tourists normally pay is that you normally go say into a marine park or a national park and you pay a fee, but it's not based on what you experience. So you might go out and you don't end up seeing anything. So with Osanai, you obviously wouldn't end up paying anything if you don't see anything. And the more animals you see, the more you pay. So it's really a success paced that will hopefully create this kind of positive loop of win-win situation for everyone over time. And at least to my knowledge, there is no other platform that currently links the direct value of marine biodiversity to coastal communities. So um, in, a, in a such a kind of tangible, transparent way, and obviously, um, I've, I've worked quite a long time in with coastal communities in developing countries, and, and I know every situation is different. And we're trying to keep the kind of that how it actually works on the ground quite flexible, so that each region, the experts that work in that region, the tourism operators that work in that region, can kind of tailor how the funds go into the ground and how they being spent. So that's kind of where we need a lot of support, obviously, in, in developing kind of successful examples. Um, but our projections are that there'll be nearly 6 million US dollars uh, generated through conservation through Ocean Eye annually, once we have uh, 600 operators um, globally, and that's, that's only a couple of percent of the total volume of operators. So we're not talking about, um, yeah, it's, it's quite significant. And obviously, some of these communities, um, for example, in Indonesia, they projected to get about 400,000 US dollars in the next five years. So obviously, you know, we need to be a little bit careful how the money enters the community and that it doesn't cause problems so that it's either given directly to a very trusted person or projects are being set up where the money is being spent, etc. But we also don't want to be kind of too forceful about it that you have to do coral restoration or you have to restore the mangrove or you have to do something because then obviously it's not an incentive if you can't decide what you do with the money that you've been given. So yeah, I think there's um, a lot to think through there to, to find a good balance so that the money goes to good projects, but it's also providing the maximum incentive. And we've already come across sites where we just know that there's political conflicts or other conflicts and giving money would probably make those worse. So then we would look for local NGOs or other trusted partners that can um, either spend the money for the monitoring of the area. So if it's an NPA, maybe the money can go into the monitoring budget and, and some, some of the community projects that are happening perhaps already, like plastic projects, health projects, education, nature-based solutions. Um, Anything, yeah, depends of the of the local needs and and what can provide an incentive. And because we kind of also looking at how to value biodiversity, obviously in places where there is no coastal communities, so high seas or polar regions or other uh, remote areas. So then we could just collect the money and then. Um, when people want to make ecosystem service payments anyway, and then it can go into some kind of um, general projects working in migratory bottlenecks. So for example, um, we're looking at projects in Timor-Leste where the blue whales migrate to Antarctica and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of needs in the coastal communities and 
we could do a lot with the money, for example, that is collected in Antarctica, what's in wildlife where there is no coastal communities. So we could work at the bottleneck of the migratory path. So open to all kinds of ideas on, on that as well, on how we could use the money and, and what kind of, kind of projects there might already be in that we could contribute to. Obviously, um, just to mention these uh, keywords that everybody's kind of tailoring their work towards. So we're obviously going to be working on biodiversity loss, climate change. I think we can look at climate adaptation, um, small island developing states, um, a, a key candidate for using ocean eye. And, and we can look at how some of the money earned can help increase climate resilience, apart from obviously having an alternative income to fishing, which might be weather dependent. Um, so also open to ideas there, how we could um, increase our impact and then obviously inequity, um, don't need to explain that. Just a few of the other SDGs, so 14 and 1 and uh, the obvious ones and obviously we'll probably be working on the networking and, and many other ones. So where we are with the product, um, we launched in April 2020. So <laughs> It wasn't the best timing, um, so we've had a multiple learning sites, but um, things were a bit slow for a few years, obviously, with them kind of closing down and opening and tourists coming and going and staff leaving and all of that. But we've now had um, collected plenty of feedback from um, different types of operators, so resort-based, uh, liverboard-based um, in different countries, developed and developing countries, as well as done a lot of the kind of tourism willingness to pay surveys and um, yeah just testing how to how to how to best make the platform you uh, work fast and not take too much time from anyone and how to get rid of replication and all kinds of uh, small tweaks that you need to do as you develop the product and We've also been looking at developing partnerships with key platforms, science providers and others ready for scaling. And that definitely is only in its kind of initial steps, which is why I'm really pleased that um, I have the opportunity to present to you. And um, our next um, updated product will be ready in end of July. So now it will have uh, all the additional features that we were requested in, as well as the file, uh, full financial transfer capacity. So before we were doing um, cash-based transfers. So now as next steps from July, end of July onwards, we're looking for more project sites globally. So as I mentioned, we can be used anywhere from poles to tropics where there is marine tourism and where Ocean9 can help make impact in, in valuing marine biodiversity and, and finding innovative ways of using that money for conservation, um, obviously with the communities being the priority. And we're looking for partners, um, especially for citizen science, um, tourism sustainability standards, we've already been talking with Green Fins, and really interested to find out about like co-impact on how to look at existing projects um, where there might already be something happening with the tourism operators or there might be already be some finance uh, plans and how we could um, kind of come in and, and help elevate the impact uh, rather than just going out and finding uh, high biodiversity sites ourselves and obviously always need help with marketing and promotions. And um, we've been um, self and kind of half grant funded to date, but we're also looking for equity investment partners now to, to fully staff and, and scale those and I. So also interested if there's any investors online. Yeah, so that's uh, us in the nutshell. Um, really interested to hear your questions and thoughts. Thank you. Sorry, thank you so much. Um, there, there are definitely there's questions that have come in and just to remind everyone who had, who uh, got here maybe a few minutes late, uh, you can send questions either through the question panel or through uh, the chat panel and with the chat you're able to send uh, thoughts to everyone, but just keep it professional and on the topic if you're sending thoughts to everyone attending the webinar. Okay, so um, for the, there's a couple of questions that were, how do you become a partner? Is it just just email you um, at Ocean Eye Conservation or are there is there any sort of formal process? Yeah, so at the More moment, fun. it's very informal, just email. 
Hello, everyone. I think we've all lost um, the audio for sorry. Well, let's give it a minute. So before we started the webinar, she let me know that. Um, sorry. OK, well, you're back. OK, we just lost you for a minute. I was about to let everyone know about the big thunderstorm and that the wireless is out where you are and that you're relying on your cell phone. Um, Okay, well, let's see if we get, sorry, I was just back for a second. Let's see if she's back. But um, right before we started, she she imparted that uh, she's on her cell phone connection because the wireless is down. Um, so hopefully she can be back. If not, uh, at least we got the main presentation. Hey, sorry, we can't hear you. We can see you. Um, okay, can we? I, we may be able to hear you now. Can you? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yep. Okay. Did Did you get my answer to the last question? Not really. No. No. Okay. So yes. So the answer was that, yeah, please email us in ocenicconservation at gmail.com. And then we can just start the conversation and get on the phone and go from there. There isn't um, any other kind of way of doing that at the moment. Okay, great. Um, there was a question. Is there, is there a terrestrial equivalent to ocean eye? So there isn't um, yet, but we are planning to um, do one. And actually we want to build the ocean eye platform at the in a way at the moment that it will be very easy to adopt it to terrestrial work and also kind of any other kind of ecosystem service payment type of projects that um, I haven't kind of thought of yet but I know there's plenty around so we're trying to make this into a platform that can then easily be adopted later on once we get ocean eye up and running and we have some bandwidth to do that okay thank you um can you talk a bit more about the methodology you use to value biodiversity? Yeah, so basically at the moment it is just based on a willingness uh, to pay surveys of tourists. And that will obviously um, depend on the location, whether it's a high end or a low end or whether it's developing or developed country. So, so for each site where OSNI will be used, um, there will be a kind of introductory data collection phase, which will allow the OSNI to kind of collect the, the information of people's willingness to pay. And then the algorithm will, based on the frequency and the willingness to pay, decide the ideal price. But like I said, um, because you know individuals' um, willingness to pay will differ still, there's then at the end, you have an option to pay, give more or give less. So it's, um, that's how it's designed at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, and your projection for the $5.8 million revenue, what is that based on? Yeah, so, well, there's obviously a very complicated financial plan at the back of it. So I'll be happy to um, have a more detailed conversation and go through it with, with anyone who wants to. But it's basically based on us reaching um, 600 um, operators within the next six to seven years. And then that's basically, we've, we've looked at that, we've done um, some surveys, we did carrying capacity surveys, then we did a willingness to pay surveys, and we've kind of modeled some sites to see kind of different type of operators, how much volume they would have, and how, how, many, how, many, how much people would donate the trip. So then we know like a, a dive resort in the Maldives will have this many people come through, they will on average give this much, and we will have 200 of these types of resorts. And therefore annually we will get a certain amount of money. And then we have added a 5% increase per year based on uh, that there will be more biodiversity because hopefully OS and I will be working. So people will be seeing more things. And then also um, kind of providing for the fact that marine tourism is increasing. So those resorts will probably be getting more volume or they will get more numerous. So there's a 5% there's a growth annually. Um, and yeah, we've modeled it on kind of real life um, tourism operations, day volumes and the willingness to pay. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. um, can you tell us more about the test sites and how that's gone? Yeah, so we, um, well, it's been a little difficult, obviously with um, 
COVID. So we had a test site in Morotai in Indonesia where we first launched the product, but then all the flights stopped and, and the tourists didn't go. But there we were able to get kind of um, quite good um, collaboration with the communities. Um, so we were able to socialize OSNI. We got information from there where they would want to use OSNI. So for example, they would want to use it for um, surveying the marine protected area for women's enterprises, uh, education, and they gave us suggestions on how to improve their app. And we also got suggestions from the operators and how to make it kind of easier to use for them. So, and we've had a few other sites like this um, with We've done presentations and, and test runs in Okinawa, uh, in Australia, and then in other parts of Indonesia. And we've also been kind of running this on some leaderboards in Indonesia, where we were obviously able to test that very complicated um, system of um, not being attached to one site and having many communities and like how, will, how would we socialize this and the trips, um, people go from boat to boat and, and yeah, how we, how we would make things flow on a day-to-day -day basis of just having a tourism operation like that, which is quite complicated. So we've, I feel like we've now had quite a, a whole, whole different range of different types of operators and communities where we've been able to get feedback and the willingness to pay. But there's obviously a, a whole big variety of different situations. So we'll have to keep developing them. The app as we get feedback and and also really keep an eye on kind of any unwanted consequences that um, injection of money to some places in this way could cause and, and come up with risk assessments and guidelines and things like that so we're also working on those um now is it is the vision that the tourism con sort of concession operator will be um working the app or that individual tourists yeah, so it can be both. So the, the initial idea was that it would just be the operator and say, you know, your boat operator for that day will log all the tourists in and then record all their sightings on the way home and then just email them the bill at the end of it. But the experience on the liverboards where things are very busy and people kind of change groups and boats and things on a daily basis, the, the suggestion was that um, the tourists themselves would administrate it for the, for the duration of the trip and the liverboard would just simply kind of show them the video and guide them and, and help them out, but that they would do it individually. So we've now, this is what we do in the product update at the moment, we add in the, the tourism interface. Yeah, so it can be both. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a fee for anyone using the app? No, so it's, it's free to use. Um, obviously you then just pay for the, your sightings. Okay, um, and there's a question, how do you promote the app? Well, we haven't really started yet, but um, we obviously looking to speak at different marine conservation um, events like this one and face-to-face -face ones as well. And then um, now that COVID's kind of winding down, we're looking to go into these big um, tourism um, kind of uh, exhibitions and road shows and, and yeah, traditional media, hopefully. Um, yeah, so we're just getting going on that. So if people have good ideas uh, where I could reach um, kind of particularly the US Caribbean or, or any other audience from that part of the world, I'm based in Indonesia, so I'm a bit more familiar with the Southeast Asia Pacific, but um, yeah, we're gonna need, a, gonna need to uh, do a bit of reach out globally, I think for the next few years. Okay, and if they did want to contact you, they just contact you at Ocean Eye Conservation yeah. at gmail.com. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a question of how do you choose the NGO to work with, um, especially in areas where there may be lots of NGOs working? Yeah, this is a good question. And I've been very careful. Like, I haven't partnered up with any NGO to date officially. And, and, there's been some interest, but I've just said, I want this to be kind of private sector own and run because um, yeah, NGOs already have a lot of work to do and, and we're trying to bring in the private sector to help with marine conservation now. So I, for me, I wouldn't choose it. I think it's for the operators to see, because you know, they will be experts in their area, what is happening, uh, what is working, what is not. And you know, I, I would listen to them and say, okay, these guys are doing really good work. The communities 
trust them, you know, we don't have any problems, um, we want to work with them. So I think I would um, not try and make uh, executive decisions out of my house in Bali. But obviously, yeah, any advice uh, once we hit the ground running in, in new locations um, will be welcome. And yeah, we can always make, um, you know, we can always then support the uh, operators if, if it looks like there's issues. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was a question about whether it's available worldwide or for specific countries. Um, I'm guessing the answer is worldwide. Um, but then, then yeah. a, another question that came up, um, is it available in different languages? Yes, so exactly. So we actually just today was sitting down with my coding team to decide where the, the language option will be. So it, you can just select the language. Um, obviously the species translations, I mean, that this is the biggest problem because the English common names um, will translate into something weird in other languages and the Google Translate doesn't get that yet. But um, all of the functionalities um, will translate and then people are going to have to follow the Latin names uh, for the sightings. Yeah. Okay. Um, question, how do you intend to cope with harassment of sensitive species and financial incentives for tour operators um, for harassment and disturbance? Yeah, so this is a question that we've got quite a lot. And I think um, we will have this um, kind of ability to report problems from the ground. So we'll have to rely on, on people to report and say, okay, this operator is actually, you know, illegally feeding animals um, and therefore people are getting sightings. And then we'll be able to suspend the operator from using O's and I, at least to, to follow up and check what's happening. And, and yeah, so we have some way of uh, policing the operators and suspend their, their accounts. Okay. And, you know, we would have to contact local contacts or authorities or whoever to follow up on that. What was the second question on that? Oh, it was, um, how do you deal with then financial incentives for tourism operators uh, for, for harassing and disturbing wildlife? Or yeah, so, yeah, so exactly the same. So it shouldn't be, um, you know, we, we want responsible operators to, to be using OSINI. And then if it turns out that it's not so we can suspend them. Okay. Um, now, is there any um, sort of payment for diversity versus just flagship species and iconic species? Yeah. So this is this is something that I keep getting um, asked. Like, could we, for example, get people to um, you know just rate a reef and the condition, whether it's bleeds um, in some parts of the world where we've been testing, there's a lot of bombing. So could we, you know, give a bigger ecosystem service payment for the sites that are not bombed, obviously, and like how to do that. But we're not, we're thinking about it, but we haven't, um, we haven't um, kind of come up with the solution for that yet. Mainly because I think it's very difficult for people to um, kind of rate an ecosystem in a way that, that it works for the citizen science that we're collecting. But um, once we get this um, kind of flagship species thing up and running, then we'll start testing how we could best do it. So if somebody has good ideas or you're already working with protocols or you're already using divers to kind of rate this kind of thing or, or other tourists to, you know, they go on a mangrove trip and they would kind of rate how they see it. I'm, I'm totally open of um, trying to think how that works. Okay, um, a question that came in, can you give us a feel for how much a tourist would pay for various sightings? So in the, in the trials, about what sort of numbers? Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. We've obviously, we've done um, a few different sites and kind of high end, low end and, and liverboards. And it kind of ranges from about, it depends like at the beginning of the trip, people are willing to pay more for say like sharks. They were like, oh, we'll pay $5 per shark. But then obviously after a week, if they've seen 60 sharks, um, it kind of goes down to like 50 cents per shark. Um, and then because people have kind of their own interesting curiosities like octopuses, for some reason, people are willing to pay like $4 and turtles $2. And yeah, it really depends kind of how long you're on that trip and how many animals you keep seeing because then you kind of, get desensitized a bit of how threatened they are and how much you should be making a contribution for. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, there's a, a question. I'm interested to know how rigorous the willingness to, to pay information is collected. There's a long history of applying these methods and their design methods, and their design can in effect influence the range of self-reported values of respondents. It seems to be centered around charismatic species. Yeah, so so the way we were doing it was um, this dive resort that we work with, they were already collecting um, kind of sightings information on key species for that area, for their own kind of science and monitoring. And then we did the willingness to pay survey on that. But then on some of the other trips, we kind of, we asked people what species they would pay, would like to value. And then, and then we went from there. But I, I certainly haven't followed any um, kind of official uh, willingness to pay kind of huge um, survey protocol. So I think we've kind of just been doing spot tests and yeah, up, kind of a little bit opportunistically where we've had partners and we've been able to do it in order to develop the product. But yeah, if somebody has um, yeah ideas how we can improve that or we, how we can collaborate with someone to get more data, we obviously will start getting more data <laughs> once, once people kind of start swiping left and right on their on their preferences, but um, yeah. Okay. It's, it's interesting, yeah. Okay, great. Um, is there some kind of medium to long-term feedback on the effectiveness of the micro of micropayments and, and how the community uses them for the conservation of natural resources? Are there indicators of the effectiveness of the measures employed? Yeah, so we obviously don't have any kind of long-term data yet, um, whether, you know, there will be a, a peak of um, compliance on, and obviously kind of we've had to think through areas where there's low seasons and how we would put in some savings mechanisms so that the payments kind of steady or for things like pandemics so that things don't kind of get reversed during the, the low tourism season. So I think there's a lot of things to kind of look at and then think how we could address them to, to make sure the effectiveness stays high. Um, and then the way we can obviously monitor it is that we would collect in digital data and we will have a, a good record of people's uh, sightings, whether they're going up and down based on the numbers and the, the, the amount of money they get and then what the communities get. They're, they're, they're kind of they're on the crown monitoring of what actually happens in the community. We'll have to kind of rest with the operators a little bit because we'll not be able to kind of visit every community every few years and kind of see what they've done with the money. So it's in a way, I'm kind of like, it doesn't really matter what they do with it. If they want to build a new mosque or a church or school or whatever it is, it's, it's welcome as long as we can see positive impact on the, on the biodiversity. So we can, yeah, we kind of, we can monitor it and have the kind of KPIs then put in into that once we start getting some baseline data. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, how will the sighting data be used? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really open for um, uh, suggestions at the moment. So the, one of the basic things we had to do is that each tourist that logs in will only see their own sightings data. And the same is for the operators. They can only see the data that they get. Only the admin can see the global data, the site. And we obviously have to do that so that poachers can't just get an account and then head out. And, and find all the good sites. Um, so, and also the operators wanna kind of protect their specific sites and areas. And, you know, there's a lot of competition in, in some parts of the world. So, and they, and they can use the data that they have collected the way they want, you know, they can use it for their own promotions, um, whatever. But then we, as the admins, we, we will get the metadata and we'll be very happy to uh, share it with the, with the governments, with researchers, with other citizen science platforms, with whoever. So I'm really open to, to hear thoughts and ways on how we can utilize this data and yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, a question that came in, what is actually motivating tourists to pay coastal communities through these marine sightings? Why wouldn't this tourist just see a marine animal and not log into the app to, to um to pay money um yeah this is a quite good question obviously as a 
as I said, keen diver and a marine conservationist myself, I'm kind of thinking like, well, of course people will want to <laughs> pay for them to make sure that they, they're still there the next year, but this is obviously not the case. And, and I think there will be quite a lot of difference between different nationalities and parts of the world. And this is some of the feedback we're getting. For example, the Liverboard said like, I have no problem doing this when I have Swiss and German divers. Um, I might have a lot more problem when I have some other type of divers. So I think it, it'll be really interesting to see um, kind of where the key segments are who will um, kind of take this on happily and then how we can incentivize the rest of the tourists to do it. And with, you know, maybe we can, Maybe we can tokenize some of this, we can um, gamify it. Um, we're looking to maybe collaborate with some of the um, dive computer providers. So maybe the, the dive data that they kind of download, we, they could get their logbooks or the sightings data and, and kind of find the ways of how it would be more interesting for people to participate and what they could get for it. So I'm definitely interested to hear of any ideas or advancements or anything on that front as soon as we got the kind of the basics up and running we'll definitely be looking at the how to incentivize the tourists a lot more okay thank you sorry um there's a question that came in and i think you've answered part of it already i'm going to read the whole thing and sort of follow up with a question i have um is ocean eye only connected to tourism companies or can it also be based on community-based tourism operations are the funds directly transferred into a local account and then who oversees the accounts and how funds are used. So I think you've answered a lot of that, but I'm curious um, if you're dealing with a region, um, is it possible for different organizations, different uh, companies to send the micropayments to different NGOs? Yes, so basically it can be tailored um, site specific and we can also tailor it between different projects in the same site. So say, you know, in some sites, there might be like three different projects and the tourists can actually choose whether they want to give to community X or a project X, X, Y, or Z in a certain community. So there's a little bit of kind of ability to choose. Um, what was the other part of the question? Well, there were lots of parts, but I think, yeah, I think you answered most of it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think you answered about who, who can be, who would be using the app and um, what sort of accountability yeah. there is for, for the recipient yeah. of the funds. Yeah, so, yeah, so basically um, the operators will at, at no point will kind of handle the money. And that was like a really big no from them because it would affect their taxation and all kinds of things. Um, and I think it's better. So the people will make digital payments and the money will come to Ocean Eye. And then we will then, um, obviously we have to think of um, you know, transaction costs. So then once, you know, certain community or NGOs um, kind of sightings hit a certain amount and it makes economic sen sense to send it, we'll, we'll send it digitally. Or in some cases, perhaps, you know, we have to facilitate um, at some other type of payment in, in local um, kind of online currency or cash or something, but we'll, we'll figure it out kind of site by site. In terms of the accountability in the community, this is obviously um, a big one. I've, I've worked in a lot of projects where some trusted person in the community took um, all of the project money and, and never came back home. And, and this, this does happen. So obviously, again, we will rely on the, the operators and the NGOs kind of ad advice on who is um, or what might be a, a kind of um, credible way of transferring the money to the community, obviously, because Kind of anybody in the village or the community can have a QR code where they can just in their smartphone look at their account. So they will anybody can look at it and see daily how much money is coming, what is based on, etc. So that at least there's some that kind of transparency that will make it very difficult for somebody to say like, no, we haven't received the money or no, we haven't had it. So it will show like how much money they are accumulating and how much has been sent through. Um, and then yeah. We'll, we'll have to see kind of what kind of protocols we might have to set up in place to kind of regularly monitor and get some feedback from the communities to make sure that nobody's misused the money and whether there has to be some changes in the way that the money is distributed. But yeah, I recognize this is, this is going to be an interesting one. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, everything has to be figured out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any sort of specific market segments uh, you, you think will be 
the, the ocean I will be particularly successful with? Would that be like single people, families? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't thought about it in that kind of terms. I mean, I think the kind of the liverboards, cruise lines and kind of other kind of types of tourism where there's very high willingness to pay, you know, your Maldivian resorts and others, I think they will be successful in that. I think people, you know, they, they very happily will make um, these kind of donations. And then obviously the kind of Southeast Asia scuba diving uh, scene, there's, there's large numbers, there's a lot of biodiversity and there's a lot of um, problems that need to be fixed. But I'm really interested, especially in this early stage, try and find projects where we can really kind of get some good biodiversity outcomes. So where we know that there's, you know, the shark finning problem or this turtle egg problem or any other kind of local problem where, where we could really, you know, target it and say that, yes, us and I, you know, can go to these kind of areas and, and deliver outcomes. So I haven't kind of thought about it from the, from the perspective of whether it's housewives or families or single travelers, but yeah, I think we'll find out. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, now we still have some more questions we'll handle, but I had a quick question for you. Um, did you want me to post the YouTube video in the chat for people to get the link for that? Yes, please, yeah, that okay. would be great, yeah. Okay, um, all right. And then um, another question that came in, um, how will you quantify long-term success? I'm sorry, Dan, I think I cut myself off. Um, how will you quantify long-term success? Yeah, so I guess, well, for my investors, it will be whether we have scaled and um, managed to um, reach our target in terms of actually making the amount of donations that we say we will. But for me, it will really be um, when we can see that the, the biodiversity numbers are going up in our sites and that we're actually providing a, a real incentive for the coastal communities. So, so the good thing is that we will obviously be collecting the data and we don't have to kind of go back and do a different types of surveys um we, we will be able to see kind of quite clearly whether yeah whether there's a difference in citing numbers or not okay and then that's the, that's the initial success and then there's obviously the bigger that we'll able to build a platform that is useful for all kinds of stakeholders and we'll be able to scale it to terrestrial and other ecosystem service payments because i think yeah we we all in there Bit of a hurry here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All, right. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Um, another question. How does the project work with local government agencies? For example, in Indonesia, is the DKP involved in any way? And then in parentheses, um, they said, I'm thinking of projects for carbon offset payments where the recipient for payments, national, provincial, local, are unclear and still being determined. Yeah. So there's definitely an some of our project sites, um, we worked with the local Bupati and the local tourism department, actually, who were kind of in charge of kind of making sure that the MPA will bring um, benefit, tourism benefits for the local communities. Um, obviously, the, you know, Decape or other uh, marine departments um, will want to be involved for the data as well and, and kind of any collaborations on, on monitoring and surveillance. So yeah, there's, a, there's quite a large element of of you know helping the local um, authorities as well and and working with them but i kind of envision that a lot of these tourism operators um already quite often have at least some level of a relationship like this because of um they work in biodiverse diverse areas and and there's obviously rules and regulations and, and permits and others involved so hopefully we can kind of navigate those um, in terms of um giving the money to community um i think because obviously um, carbon credits and, and others are quite a big hot potato and, and I live in Indonesia and I know there definitely there's, there's a lot of different interests pulling this into different ways. But I think because we kind of approaching this from a complete kind of private sector, additional donation kind of thing, we're not kind of, you know, permanently valuing and, and then monetizing the national asset that no one else can kind of get to because it's just, you know, you see something and then it's gone. You don't, we don't kind of claim ownership or kind of any kind of long-term thing. So I'm kind of envisaging that this will be a lot more easier touristically in, in different countries, but yeah, it remains to be seen. <laughs> yeah. 
And if, right. if you can see some problems, um, how this might work in different countries, I'd be really interested to hear so we can like try and preempt them. Okay, thank you, yeah. sorry. And sorry, we actually have come to the end of the questions that have been sent in. Um, it was a very lively uh, question and answer, so we really appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate- okay, questions. Yes. Um, so I just say thank you to everyone who, thank you to Sari for, for, uh, for presenting and, and doing this work. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to follow this and uh, over the coming years. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, really looking forward to actually using it myself someday. And uh, thank you to everyone who, who attended today. Uh, we hope you have a good rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Great. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Best wishes to everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.